Hi, and welcome to Skrelliga. This is chapter 11, the Continental Revolution. So where we left off, the American Revolution was happening on the continent, which was largely the, the business owners and large landowners, but also the common people of America, were upset at a lot of taxation being levied to pay for the French and Indian Wars, because up until this point, all the taxation had been done via the colony. And now the British Parliament from across the ocean was taxing them, but they didn't have representation in the British Parliament. And so, you know, that, that whole thing, I'm not going to go into all the details about the American Revolution, but that was happening. This escalated through a series of conflicts, like the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party. It was mostly in Boston, but... But then in 1775, the battles of Lexington and Concord happened, and that led to the retreat of the British forces to Charlestown. And then the colonial forces put Boston under siege. In Skrelica, the British controlled the Lower Sigwan Valley due to their presence in Fort Charles. Many in Skrelica sympathized with the rebels, especially the English-speaking settlers from New England who settled in the outer settlements. Sentiments weren't quite as strong in the Lower Valley, just because a substantial proportion of the population was still Skrelligan speaking, and a lot of the revolution had to do with this idea of the rights of Englishmen, which doesn't really have the whole the same sway of a people who weren't really English in the same way. That sympathy kind of began to go away pretty quickly, though. Later in 1775, American privateers raided Little Vic, which was one of the few outlying towns that was not sympathetic to the rebels. And they attacked shipping routes to Skrelica, leading to a partial blockade of the islands that would last for the next three years. The war was not going well for the British regulars on the mainland. Governor Thomas Gage was recalled without a replacement on the 11th of October, and Boston was evacuated on the 17th of March, 1776. And so that meant there was no formal government for Skrelica, which was still technically part of Massachusetts. And in fact, at this point, most of Skrelica was also under control of Massachusetts. So in the meantime, the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia and Naval Commander Marriott Arbuthnot effectively took charge at this point. The actual governor of Nova Scotia, Francis Legger, or leg, I don't actually know how you pronounce that. Can't really get back and ask him. Um, but he had also been recalled. Um, he was having a tough time dealing with dissent within Nova Scotia, um, which was kind of in a similar position of being being supportive of the continental rebels. Though the thing, which had still been around during all this, just as a informal advisory council, they began to assert local control in non-military matters. With the blockade and with sentiments for the colonial rebels falling quite dramatically, by the end of 1778, Old Skrelica was back under the control of the British. 1779 began a new strategy for the British. They wanted to settle a new colony on Penobscot Bay in Maine for the Loyalists, and they'd call it New Ireland. So a lot of Loyalists had been kicked out of territory occupied by the rebels. So this would give them new land, and it would make Skrelica a little bit less isolated from the remaining British territory. Because at this point, British control of the 13 colonies was limited to New York City after they recaptured it in July of 1776, and coastal Georgia around Savannah, which they had captured in December 1778. So that way, there would be another colony between Skrelega and Nova Scotia, and that would help strengthen the supply lines. On the 30th of May, eight British Navy ships set sail from Halifax with 640 troops. They captured the village of Castine and erected Fort George up the hill. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts launched an expedition to retake the area. They laid siege to Fort George for 21 days. Despite outnumbering the British, the Massachusetts forces had to retreat upon the arrival of reinforcements, and then when they were blocked in Penobscot Bay, they had to burn their ships and return on foot. After that significant victory, New Ireland would not be invaded again for the remainder of the war.
The war on the continent effectively came to an end in October of 1781, where the British army surrendered in Yorktown, Virginia. There was a rescue fleet sent for the British, but they were intercepted by a larger French fleet, and that forced the surrender of the British army. New York City, Charleston, and Savannah were still occupied by the British, as well as New Ireland and Skrelica, but the British didn't make any further attempts to invade. Peace negotiations began the next year in Paris, in April 1782. The first proposal from the French was going to set the western border of the U.S. at the Appalachians. This was strongly opposed by the Americans, because one of the acts that had helped spark this conflict in the first place was the Proclamation Line of 1763, which bounded the U.S. settlement to the Eastern Continental Divide, mainly along the Appalachian Mountains. Um, So this led the United States to negotiate directly with the British for a better deal. There were two kind of big sticking points. Um, Well, among other things, New Ireland and Skrelica had to be dealt with. They were both claimed by Massachusetts, but at this point occupied by the British. And the British were, in this treaty, were being pretty generous to the Americans. They were hoping that the U.S. would be a valuable trade partner in the future, given that they'd still have their Canadian possessions. And this would, in fact, be the case. They would continue to have strong trade ties. So for that reason, New Ireland was granted to the U.S., and its residents moved west to found St. Andrews in what became New Brunswick. Skrelica was a little trickier, though. It was a British fortification really close to New Hampshire and Massachusetts, including Maine, but the divided population meant that it would be a potentially rebellious area to try to administer if the U.S. were to try to claim all of it. Given the challenge that this could face for the new country, The U.S. accepted the cession of Skrelica, but this was made easier by very generous terms elsewhere, which drew the western border of the U.S. at the Mississippi River. So the first initial impact of this loss was migration. Tens of thousands of loyalists fled the 13 newly independent states, including about 35,000 to Nova Scotia, which at this point included Skrelica. 2,000 went to Prince Edward Island, and 10,000 went to Quebec, which at this point included modern-day Ontario. There were smaller numbers that fled further, some bound for Britain itself, and some for the British West Indies. Of the 35,000 that fled to Nova Scotia, 4,000 moved to the islands of Skrelica. Around half accepted land grants in the upper Sigwon River Valley in the towns of Eaglestead and Bradstreet. There was some conflict with these new loyalist immigrants, as a substantial proportion of the citizens outside of the Lower Sigwon Valley were colonists from New England. But given the vast numbers of new immigrants, the New Englanders were forced to either leave or accept these new citizens. The population of the Lower Valley was more mixed between Skrelligan speakers, English speakers, and others, and the impact of new immigration was less significant. The earlier Thorimer plan in Skrelborough and the Havent grid made housing the immigrants a much more straightforward process. Another significant demographic to move to Skrelica were black people, both free and enslaved. Prior to 1780, there were about 150 to 200 black people on the islands, and most but not all were slaves. And those numbers aren't exact because the census, all the censuses before, had just focused on counting whether someone was free or a slave. They weren't tracking any ethnicity or language data. But in the following decade, this population more than doubled due to two factors. There was the black loyalists and the slaves of white loyalists. The British crown had promised freedom to slaves who could escape and serve the loyalists, starting with Dunmore's proclamation in November 1775 in Virginia, And this was expanded by the Phillipsburg Proclamation on the 30th of June, 1779. Both of these effectively would free escaped slaves from patriots in all of the colonies. So anyone who was rebelling, if their slaves could escape and get to the British, then, then they could serve the British army and would be promised their freedom. As you've probably seen throughout history, the, the British did not regularly keep their promises. In some cases, there were so many that they ordered them to return to their masters. 
but a large portion of them did end up getting their freedom, and the British facilitated the immigration of several thousand of these former slaves. This included around 3,000 who were evacuated from New York to Nova Scotia, of which 300 ended up in Skrelika. Uh, the white loyalists, however, uh, brought slaves of their own, about 80 of them. So that meant now that free black people outnumbered slaves. The number of free black people in Skrelika helped rejuvenate the abolition movement. At this point in time, the Massachusetts Constitution had banned slavery, but this only applied to the American-controlled portion of the province. Uh, this is where we stick the huge asterisk that saying the Massachusetts Constitution bans slavery is a huge oversimplification. Whether or not the Constitution intentionally bans slavery, that I don't know. Maybe or some of the people who wrote it did try to ban it. Maybe they didn't. But there was a series of cases before the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court in 1781 that established that slavery was, in fact, against the new state constitution, which was written in 1780. Unlike the way the U.S. Supreme Court works after Marbury v. Madison, this did not immediately free all of the slaves, but it meant that whatever legal support there had been for the system was gone. And by 1790, the official number of slaves on the, sen on the census was zero. And the big asterisk... The legal status of slavery in Skrelica was unclear. Once it was merged into Nova Scotia, there was no real legal backing for the practice. And then a combination of abolitionist movements and diminishing economic benefits of slavery meant that the practice died out in the early 1800s, well before the formal abolition across the British Empire in 1834. So Skrelica had been part of the province of Massachusetts Bay as we've mentioned, but since the rest of the province was in rebellion against Britain, Skrelica was governed from Halifax, Nova Scotia. This was formalized in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris, which merged Skrelica into Nova Scotia, but the summer of the next year, with the influx of loyalist immigrants, Nova Scotia was split into four different provinces. The continental portion of Nova Scotia, I mean, Nova Scotia is connected, but like the part that isn't the peninsula, um, that was split into New Brunswick, primarily as a new loyalist colony. Cape Breton was also split off, though that part of Nova Scotia rejoined in 1820. And now Skrelica was an independent colony, the province of the Skrelica Islands. The thing took this opportunity to reorganize and become the formal legislature of the province. Governor Thomas Spencer was appointed by the British Crown, although he was demoted to lieutenant governor in 1786 when the governorships of British North America were consolidated and Guy Carleton was appointed the governor general of the Canadas. The final reorganization took place in 1791, when Quebec was divided into Upper and Lower Canada in order to better separate the French-speaking Canadians from the new Loyalist immigrants. The last census had been completed in 1764, but with the further immigration and the wave of Loyalist refugees and just splitting up the Skrelic Islands into their own colony, another count was needed. Yet again, in 40 years, the total population had nearly doubled, counting at 19,366 people. There were three large groups at this point that you could kind of define. There were the Old Skrelligans, the Yankees, and the Loyalists. Old Skrelligans formally referred to people descended from the independent Skrelligans before the Danish took over, as well as assimilated Abenaki. But with time, that definition began to include other Scandinavian immigrants like the Danes and the Swedes and the Norwegians. And that was about five or 6,000 people by the time the 1786 census came around. The Yankees refer to the English immigrants during its time as part of Massachusetts Bay. Uh, they were the largest group at around 8,000 in the 1786 census, so the largest group, but not a majority. Many of these immigrants were not directly from England, but came from New England and settled outside of the lower Siguan Valley, especially in the upper Siguan Valley. They were the strongest supporters of being part of the United States, though this support was a lot lower now than it was at the beginning of the war. 
The Loyalists were the latest group, which started with a minority of English immigrants, but in the aftermath of the revolution, it grew massively. By 1786, there were over 4,000 of them. They were strong supporters of the crown and the larger empire. In addition, some prominent minorities included Jews, who were still mostly separate from the other groups at around 200, the so-called unassimilated Abenaki, who were Abenaki who accepted Skrelican rule, but otherwise stayed separate from the rest of them. And there was about 400 of them. There were about 550 Black Skrelicans. Black Skrelicans were in no way a monolith, though. So some of them were current or former slaves of both Yankees and Loyalists, but a large new group that came in were the Black Loyalists, the former slaves throughout the United States who escaped and fought for the Loyalists in exchange for the promise of freedom. So after the census was completed, the thing established nine formal districts to elect representatives. Um, before it was kind of, uh, there was a set number assigned to each town, but then there were a lot of members and the, the numbers weren't that proportional, especially with the new immigration, and which didn't matter that much when it wasn't didn't have any power anyway. But now that it did, the boundaries were set. Uh, so there were nine districts. Skrelbra was the biggest in terms of population and was assigned six thing men or M thorns or MPs sometimes in English, just to account for the massive population. And this district also include, included Copperstein, which was annexed afterwards. So it would cover just the whole city, town. I don't know if you call it a city or a town at this point. Uh, Middleton and Apanakibara were assigned two thingmen. Haven't was assigned two. New Hope and Raskram were assigned two. And that's in total, um, shared between them. Northstead and Ragnarsson were assigned two. Bradstreet and Eaglestead were assigned three. Freydeston and the Southern Islands were assigned one. The Atlantic District was created, uh, including Little Vic, Thorfall, and Atlantica, and assigned one thing matter. And the North District, with Northney, Burnett, North Bay, North Sound, and Fjallvik, was assigned one. So in total, there were 20 members of the new thing, and to this day, the thing would operate in much the same way, with different districts, each with a set number of representatives all going to the thing. And to wrap things up, we've got a time lapse here of me putting together a shipyard right next to Fort Charles. So I figure now that Skrelica is a very strategic position, the British will want uh, to start having a naval base here. 
some of the ships are a bit ac anachronistic, they're too modern, but I couldn't really find anything on the workshop, and this kind of went past the line of things that I'm willing to sink a ton of time into. It's a small detail that isn't going to last for that long, and I didn't want to spend so much time making one custom ship. We'll wrap this episode up with some before and after shots. And that covers Skrylica during the American Revolution and how it went from being part of Massachusetts to being its own independent British colony. Uh, thanks for putting up with the wait, if you were waiting. <laughs> um, yeah, no promises on when the next one is coming out. This is going to be the end of part two. And then part three is going gonna, is gonna to be a lot shorter than any of the other parts. Uh, I'm going to kind of cover up to the Canadian Confederation. Um, no spoilers on where Skrelligo will be with all that. But yeah, the Canadian Confederation and all the stuff with parts of the British Empire becoming dominions. And again, no spoilers. Um, that'll be part three. But I want to get into some more asset creation. If you're paying close attention to some of the more recent shots, it's possible that you would have seen some like vanilla tanker trucks in there um, because the city skylines industry will import oil, but I don't have like none of those hand carts and none of those vehicles are designed for oil because they're just open carts. Like it doesn't make sense. So I want to make something that's like looks like an oldish tanker truck. And then the other one, which I'll be, which I'm excited to finally start working on, is an omnibus. So like the kind of the original bus, the horse-drawn, um, just kind of like a horse-drawn wagon, but designed for urban transport. And eventually that'll lead into trams. Yeah, and then we can get to trains, but that'll be for a while. So excited to do that. But again, that's like, I'm busy with too many things. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thanks for listening to my rambling, Ben, and hope you enjoyed. <laughs>